a couple of questions came up uh, yesterday. One was about exporting data from the, uh, the crash database site that is on LCAC. And so I want to share with you how we can go about doing that. And then there were some other questions um, regarding uh, answering the questions about the ABC contact. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get back to, um, okay, I'm going to try to go back to getting to the crash website, getting onto the LTAC's website. So can everybody see my screen that says the word Zoom on it? Should be able to see that. Okay, all right. So if I go up here, I'm going to open up the LTAC website. That's LTAC.org. Now can everybody see the LTAC website? Yes. So you just, oh, thank you. Okay, so we've just simply brought up the LTAC website, uh, LTAC.org. And across the top, you'll see the word resources. My pointer is on. So I'm going to click resources. And hopefully that's going to bring up then the resources that are over on the right hand side of the web page and we're going to scroll down just a little bit under maps and you'll see right in the middle you'll see the interactive crash map and it's interesting to note we're not going to go there today but there's an interactive bridge map so if you've got your bridge program going and you're interested interested in the bridge locations and so on you can click on that let's go to the interactive crash map and there it is can everybody now see the state of idaho with all the big polka dots okay. yes Okay, so once again, we're going to go over to the left-hand side, click the button. It's got the little pin on it here, and it's just going to bring up uh, a bunch of defaults. And so we're going to leave those defaults just like they are. Okay, and you can notice that my pointer is over on the default of safety, selected items, and it'll show the counties on the map. We just want to leave those alone for the purposes of trying to get more safety data. So I'm going to go across the top and I'm going to come to the first filter here and it'll say select and customize an area filter. And I want to go back to the Canyon Highway District. So if we go down towards the bottom, we can, we've got the opportunity to pick an ITD district, a county, a city, but I'm really interested, of course, in the local road jurisdictions. And there's all the local road jurisdictions, but rather than scroll down through those, I can start just typing Canyon Highway District and it comes up and there it is, okay? And so we're now in the data that it just pertains to the Canyon Highway District, but I wanna filter just a little bit more. So let's go over to the detailed filter. You can see my pointer at the top left-hand corner of your screen. And there's the advanced filter, okay? And so on the highway system, I'm gonna go ahead and leave the state and local clicked. I'm going to leave all my crash severities clicked because I'm interested in all of my crash severities. And we're going to cover just a moment what A, B, C, and means. Of course, as we said yesterday, we want five years worth of data. That's ideal. Uh, the number of vehicle units, and so I'll just leave that alone. Those tie back to the, what is coded onto the crash report and just leave all of those buttons clicked all the time because that'll give you all the data that you need. Intersection related, yes, it's intersection related, but I, I know I want to go to an intersection, so I'm going to click no. Um, crashes that aren't on the intersection, I'd like to go ahead and get rid of those. The intersection type, I want to make sure I click all of those. And the first harmful event, make sure you just have all of those clicked in there, they're preset that way. So let's filter it out. Now I want you to look at the dots on the map as I click the filter button. You can see a lot of those dots went away. And the reason for that is we're only now interested in the intersections, okay? So I want a little bit more screen, screen footprint here. So I'm gonna click the X on the left-hand side just to get rid of that menu. It's still there, we can come back to it, but it gives me a little more working room. And I, I'm not ready to click and drag a draw rectangle around anything yet. So I wanna come up to this square and go back to the Mighty Claw. The Mighty Claw lets me move the map around. And also, I get to zoom in. And remember, I'm interested in the intersection of Homedale Road and South Indiana Avenue. Now, there might be a little bit better way, but I see Homedale. I'm getting close. There's Homedale Road. I'm going to go on across. Okay, come on down. Come on down. We're still on Homedale Road. Um, Armway. There's Montana. Am I getting close? Am I getting close? By golly, there it is, South Indiana Avenue. 
in Holmdale Road. I can zoom in a little bit further. Whoops, I'm zoomed in a little too far. And there's the intersection that I'm interested in, okay? So now I'm ready to drag and, and drop my rectangle because I want to capture all those crashes. So if I drag and drop my rectangle, boom, at the very bottom of the screen now comes up my database going back five years for that intersection. And as you can see, you can see the headings across the top and there's a lot of them. I'm not gonna go through them again, but we don't need all of those headings. You know, so as you create your own spreadsheet and you create your own way of, of capturing the data, you're probably gonna to wanna to get rid of some of these columns or when you create your own spreadsheet, create your own columns. So really give a lot of thought as to what column would be important to you because we're gonna create a spreadsheet here in just a moment, okay? So the question then yesterday was to, to is there a way to export this? Okay, rather than try to copy this by hand or put it in a spreadsheet. Let's see if we could do that. So if I go over to the next tab from the advanced filter button and you can see my pointer, it's gonna go, it's going to allow me hopefully to export. So I get to load, download my statistics, okay? And I get to select a download format. Now I'm not a genius, okay? And I know just enough to be extremely dangerous, but I wanted to, I wanna select a CSV spreadsheet, which is hopefully gonna get be to an Excel spreadsheet, okay? And so then I've got 36, uh, crashes selected. It's selected that for me automatically. So I want to click on selected 36. Okay. And it's going to start to download. And you can see in my lower left hand corner, it starts to download into an Excel spreadsheet. I want to open my Excel spreadsheet and let's see if we've got success today. There it comes up. It's going into now my Excel spread program. And there's an Excel spreadsheet for you. Okay. We can't see that yet, Brent. Okay, so I get, get, let me see if I can get back to share. Very good, thank you. Let's switch it out. Should be able to see it now. All right, great, thank you, Don. And so you can see the Excel spreadsheet, and it's like any, for those of you who use Excel, it's just like any other Excel spreadsheet. You have to now go in and, and uh, you can massage your data and start cleaning it up. You know, as an example, you might want to go in and, and start looking at, okay, you know, I, Got some of the some of the columns are, are cut off, so let's go to an auto fit. There's the auto fit. I like to you know make my header columns bold. Okay, so there's bold. Uh, you know I don't like the first two columns. I'm not going to use that data anyway. You know, so I can delete those columns. And the point of my story is is now you can start just customizing this. And so as you look at each one of these bold headings, you're not going to use all of those, especially in the customized spreadsheet you might build for your jurisdiction. But now you can go ahead and save this spreadsheet into your computer and use it later on. So, so anyway, I hope that answers the question that was asked yesterday. How can I, how can I uh, download this data and then just use it from there in a very, in a more simplified format? So I'm going to stop right there and just ask, have I answered that question? Hopefully, yes. And I see there, Emery is, is popping up on mute. I don't know if you want to say something there. Okay. Okay. Any, any other thoughts or questions on that? So you can export this data. It comes a little bit of a, a bit of a raw format, but you can then rename stuff and massage it. And it's a whole lot better than copying it down or, or creating a, a spreadsheet from scratch. So I'm going to go back to my presentation. Brent, we had a question. Um, could you go back to your um, website and show us how to select if it's not a rectangle? Okay. Um, yeah, let me see if I can get back to that. Just a sec here. Okay, so the question was, is how can you select if it's not a rectangle, okay? All right, I'm gonna go back here, to the filters. And so if it's not a rectangle, I'm gonna see if I can reset. Okay, so I've reset now. And so are you looking for like a circle area? 
so on. I think the only the, the software that I've been able to figure out, and your the experts from LTAC might be a better source for the answer, is that it will only draw rectangles. So let me just let me just do something here real quick. Let me zoom out. Okay. And let's say that if you're interested in a corridor or a, or a section of, of uh, crashes along the corridor, not necessarily an intersection, you can draw a rectangle down through that corridor, or you can have the corridor and capture that associated intersection, and it'll pick up all those data points. Okay. I don't believe that it will draw like circles around things. It could. Uh, there's, a, there's a button here that, that, that talks about let's reset this. There's a button here that says click to draw shape, and I haven't been able to get that one to work. So but right now it's just drawing rectangles for me. And so I'm capturing the, another set of, of data points. So about drawing shapes or circles, you might have to have a little further conversation with the designers at LTAC. Sorry, that I don't think that was a good answer. Oh, you're fine. Um, if, if other people have questions on that, um... I'm honestly not the best person to ask either, but we can keep up with Matthew and he can he can walk you through some really specifics on that. Actually, I was just goofing around with it. And if you click on that, click to draw shape, and then you put the, you click on your cursor and then you can plot a shape. Let's see. So instead of holding your mouse down, you just click. And then it allows you to a starting point, and then you click to make your shape, if that makes sense. It does. So I think it just takes a little bit of playing with. But the, but the main thing I wanted to do is just share with you an answer to the question about how you're able to export that data and, and save it to a spreadsheet and then work on it, work on it later. So. The second question we had, and I just put a slide in the slide deck, was about the, we see the, the terminology of serious injury A, B, and C. So I just put this slide in the slide deck. You can have this for future reference. But a serious injury, as I mentioned when we started our time together, was a very incapacitating injury. Chances are you might not be normal again. And there's the definition that comes out of the, uh, the crash report that Idaho Transportation puts out. So A injury is very incapacitating, it's very serious. A visible injury B is non-incapacitating, but it is an evident injury uh, that is recorded and, and you're probably gonna have to live with it for some time. And a C injury is a possible injury. And these are all determined in the field. They're either determined by law enforcement, which are not typically medical experts, or if, if, if medical paramedic ambulance is on the scene, they will also determine this as well and communicate back to law enforcement. Law enforcement is the one, ones that actually enter this into the, into the crash report. So while there's no detailed medical physician, you might say, at the scene, unless there's some follow-up in the crash reporting, somebody going to the hospital, that's how that is generally determined. And so those are the definitions. A C injury is an injury reported. It is not a fatal injury, incapacitating or not incapacitating. So it's just a kind of maybe a possible injury people are complaining. And then of course there's property damage only and in the state of Idaho, crash where there's property damage of more than $1,500 is a reportable crash. And again, you don't have an auto body expert out there trying to determine or, or property damage experts out there trying to determine this. This is just the best estimate that people are that are at the site of the crash are giving at the time. So I hope that's answered that question. Okay, so Let's go ahead and, and, uh, and move on here. Okay, so we're talking about data compilation. And we talked about problem identification yesterday, and we're gonna have a little short section on data compilation. And so here's our first, our first breakout session, okay? I want you guys, and remember I asked you to have a pencil and a piece of paper kind of handy. Don's gonna set up a, a breakout session, and here's the question that I need everybody to answer, and she's gonna bring that question up, is given your review of the crash data from the LTAC website, and we just visited it just a moment ago, 
what elements or type of data elements would you list or show that would tell the crash story the best? So if you were to sit down and just kind of hand draw a spreadsheet and across the top, you wanted to put uh, those elements that you were interested in, like time of day, uh, severity of crash, that type of thing, what would be important to you? And so what I would like you to do is list maybe the top four to six elements that would come into your mind. We'll give you just a few minutes to do that. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dawn and she can give us direction on how we're going to get into our breakouts. All right, guys. So um, we're going to test out the breakout room session. Um, it's going to launch and then you'll end up in the same screen you're on right now, but it'll only show like four other people with you, depending on how it breaks out. We'd like you to talk amongst yourselves for the next five minutes on this question. So I've posted the question in the chat box for you guys to read it over one more time. Given your review of the crash data from the LTAC website, what elements or types of data elements do you think would best tell um, the crash story? And so I'm going to work on that really quick, send you guys to your breakout rooms. Um, at the end of the breakout rooms, it'll send you right back to this main screen. So we're going to do it. So there's four or five participants um, in each room. And I'm going to create those room right now. And I'm going to send you off. And we'll have a countdown um, to come back in about five minutes. We'd like one person from each of those groups to plan on speaking back to the group, the whole group, kind of saying what you guys came up with for your top five or six um, column headings that you would use in your own spreadsheet. So everybody should be coming back to the main session. We'll take a second. So everybody should be popping back to that main set, um, session. Um, and once we get everybody here, we can kind of go over what trends you guys came up with as a group. So we, sh we should have picked cool breakout group names. Shut yeah, up. I just thought about that. <laughs> Like like the Panthers or something. Yeah, team names, not a mascot. That should have been our first one. <laughs> like everybody's slowly joining back. You're getting there. I think we're I think we're almost all there. Yeah. Awesome. So you guys met in your small groups and were able to discuss kind of what your top five um, elements or, or hot topics would best tell the crash story. Um, so we'd like to kind of go through and have one representative from each of the groups just kind of speak on, on what your team came up with. Um, you can either talk about all five or if there was like, you know, a couple of things that you think are like absolutely important, we can kind of the highlights so if we can get one person to just kick us off okay independent will do but all right we have location of the intersection uh, weather conditions and road conditions number of vehicles injury levels we have quite a few so it's more than five just wants top five Top five or six, you know, some of the things that might be important, but you can make as as, as big as you want. Yeah, well, the cause, kind of what caused the accident, why, try to determine that more. Time of day, mm -hmm. um, speed limit of the area coming into the intersection, intersection type, driver age, obstructions. That's kind of what we come up with for most important. Oh, wow, I'm impressed. Okay, go on. <laughs> In our group, we did uh, intersections, like if they're around subdivisions or like stores or stuff like that to look into. Time of day, day of the week, um, surface conditions, uh, impairment, weather, or visibility. I can't I'll go over here. I'm not sure they. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead with our group. We have a uh, time of day, day of week, 
service conditions, severity of injury, and number of units. Um, and then after that, we had a few more like speed limit and uh, direction of travel and the, the type of surface. So was it pavement or gravel? Okay, Art, would you like to go? Okay. I'm not sure there's, a, there's anything else to add from what has been discussed before, but in our group, we did also talk about to clarify the data that we will eliminate some of those issues, such, such as eliminating impaired driving, as well as eliminating the, I want to see other one we talked about, or oh, animals. Um, the area in Bennett County has a lot of uh, animals, so by eliminating them, it will probably paint a different picture to us. That's what I would say. That's a good one. And our group did a similar, or created a similar list. So we have date and time, the severity of the crash, contributing factors, surface condition, if it's intersection related, and the first harmful event. Uh, our group, uh, our list is pretty similar. Um, it had uh, weather conditions, severity, uh, the number of vehicles and the type of vehicles we thought would be really important to know too. Um, the contributing circumstance, time of day, and also the speed limit. For us, about the only thing I thought we should add would be uh, signage, speed limit, you know, kind of what's going on around the intersection. Were we able to get all the groups? Did we miss anybody? I don't think so. Okay, so we'll turn it back over to Brent. Hey, wow, I'm impressed. I mean, you know, just taking just a few minutes just to think about this, even in a group setting, you've come up with a lot of great uh, things that are very important to you as you would implement an intersection safety program. So what I'm gonna do is go back to just that simple spreadsheet, just real quickly like. This was the spreadsheet we, we downloaded or exported from the Crash Data website. And you can see now that you could go across that top column, eliminate the columns that you don't feel like are gonna be very beneficial to you, put in your all the columns that you thought were important to you, maybe add a few, and voila, you have a really, really nice starting point for, for your spreadsheet. So. I just wanted to kind of go back and share that with you. So you're not really reinventing the wheel. You've got a lot of great data. You're just now going through a filtering process internal to yourselves and your own organization as to what's important to you. So let's go ahead. Okay, so any other question about this, the simple spreadsheet uh, reaction exercise? Here's one, I'm, I'm really sad to show this. This is a lame one. This is kind of an example I'm present. I'm flashing up there, but I'm here to tell you that all the headings you guys came up with are much better than these. So the only thing that, that uh, you might want to consider putting in that spreadsheet, when we look at source of information, you know, yesterday we talked about the crash reporting from law enforcement. You might want to be, um, you might be interested in maybe capturing some of the anecdotal information, maybe some of the near miss information, something maybe reported from the local newspaper, that type of thing. So anyway, good job, everybody. I mean, I am really impressed off you go. So again, when you create your simple spreadsheet template, uh, this slide basically just kind of gives what is considered some of those important headings, but you obviously came up with, with a lot more than these that are just as important as well. So let's go to a polling question. And I'm interested in knowing, have you ever been asked to help identify and prioritize crash locations as operators and maintainers of the highway? So Don's going to bring that up. We'll give it a few minutes and I'll let Don get you going.
So we've got this next poll up. Have you ever been asked to help identify and prioritize crash locations? So a couple more minutes on that and we'll end that poll and share those results with the group. All right, last, last call. We're going to close this up. There's your results, Brent. Okay, all right. And so the reason I wanted to ask this question is as we came back and talked about how the highway operates, I called them the Fab Three, the people who are the most knowledgeable about highways operate on a day-to-day -day basis and where those safety concerns might be. And certainly people who maintain and operate the highway are at the top of the list, they're in the fab three. Law enforcement, because they're very intimately involved when crashes happen, and EMS. So I just wanted to bring that up, how important that is, because there's a lot of great information that those who are very close to what's happening on the highway can lend when you put together an intersection highway safety program. And so I'm a little disappointed that uh, that we have 62% that answer no, and I, I wish that would re was reversed. And I hope as time goes on, highway districts will recognize the need as you go into safety programs to get the information and knowledge and opinions of those who are very close to the operation of the highway. Um, so we've talked about problem identification. What's, what, what is going out there? Uh, what's, what is the, what's the crash data telling us? How can we get a hold of the crash data? We've talked about once we get a hold of the data, how we can compile it, put it in a spreadsheet. And somebody was asking the question yesterday about prioritization. So we can start talking and thinking about how we want to prioritize. Remember, I have never met a highway district yet that said, oh, I'm sorry, no thanks, I don't need any more money. Please don't send me any more. Okay, money's always in short supply. So we're very, very interested in how we can prioritize so we can get our best return on investment. So I wanna talk just a little bit now about safety analysis and how we can go about analyzing some of what we've found and how we've compiled it. Now let's talk just a little bit about how we can analyze and prioritize in a simple manner. So when we conduct the safety analysis, it's gonna assist you in identifying intersections with those safety issues and that more importantly, or as important, is to start pointing you towards the good countermeasures or solutions that will help fix the problem. So I want to talk just a little bit about crash frequency. Crash frequency represents the number of crashes that have occurred at a particular intersection over a period of time. So I kind of want to restate that. The number of crashes that appear or occur over a particular period of time is crash frequency. So remember, we're always really interested in five years worth of data. Three years is good, but five years is better. So that's our period of time, and we can capture the number of crashes that is happening based on the data that we're finding. This allows you to summarize the crashes by type and location. So and we can display those crashes on a map, which is really good. You can bring that up electronically, or if you lack these resources, there's nothing wrong with push pins and a paper map. And you can start to kind of provide a report identifying those intersections that have a historical problem with crashes. Once the information is collected and displayed, you can then go about comparing the intersections using kind of a, an analysis, step back, look at the map, kind of start to prioritize in your mind, you know, where would we want to spend our money to get the best return on investment. However, when we look at simple comparisons, comparisons such as crash frequency, we have to be a bit careful um, because they can be just a little bit skewed. And I'll show you here in a second what I'm, what I'm talking about. Another way to look at analysis, and this is kind of a basic analysis just using crash frequency, but a better way to kind of look at things is using the analysis of determining a crash rate. Okay. So crash frequency alone often is, can be inadequate when comparing multiple intersections or prioritizing 
um, your locations for improvement. But crash rates can be an effective tool that kind of gets you back to comparing up the intersections on an apples to apples basis. It can measure the relative safety at a particular intersection. And really, you can think about it along the lines of it's the ratio of the crash frequency, which is the crashes per year or crashes of period of time, to vehicle exposure. So now we're introducing the number of vehicles, the volume in that intersection. We can all agree that not every intersection has the same volume of traffic passing through it on a per day basis, per year basis, or like a five year basis. While frequency gives us the number of crashes per period of time, um, crash rate now starts to introduce that volume and allows us to get to apples to apples when we start comparing intersections. So crash rates analysis can be a useful tool to determine how a specific intersection compares to the average intersection on a roadway network. And it can help you now justify why you're spending money at certain locations. And again, remember your needs are always going to be greater than your safety budget. So here's kind of how crash crash um, rate analysis works. It's a very simple calculation. And for example, it's possible that you might have two intersections within your jurisdiction. Let's just call them intersections A and intersections B that have a similar number of crashes. So each intersection has not about the same amount of crashes. I've only got so much money. Where would I put my money to improve the intersections? However, intersection A may have more vehicles entering the intersection on a typical day than on intersection B. In order to effectively compare the safety of the two locations, you may need to factor in the level of exposure. And when we talk about the term exposure, we're talking about the term crash, or I'm sorry, the term volume or vehicular volume, and introduce volume into each intersection. So exposure data here is represented by the number of vehicles entering the intersection and so you need to have traffic volume in order to make all of this work. I know for some traffic volume and gathering the volume data has been a bit of a struggle, although I think it's over the years it's getting better and better. And I think there's mechanisms in place more and more to go out there with traffic counters and, and, and ways of determining volume on your roadway. And I know that volume is going to become even more important uh, as time unfolds as far as being able to, to seek funding. So crash rate is often used to prioritize locations for safety improvements when you're working with limited budgets. So you can get that best return on investment. Crash rates can be calculated, and this is a widely accepted equation that's shown up on your, on your screen right now. And this crash equation, or this crash rate equation, can be used for any type of crash or severity. So if you have anybody telling you that this won't work because you've got more severe crashes, or it won't work because your crash types are different. That is not the case. This works no matter what your crash type and your crash severity might be. So the intersection crash rate is based on the vehicles entering the intersections is calculated like this. There's the equation and R equals the crash rate for the intersection expressed as crashes per million vehicles entering the intersection. The C value is the total number of intersection related crashes in the study period. And we were able to figure that out because we went back and, and looked at our data that was available for a five year period. And in the case of going back to Canyon Highway District, there were 36. But N is the number of years of data. Three is okay to use, five is better. If you wanna use seven, that might be okay. And V equals the traffic volumes entering the intersection daily. daily. So that's a daily count of the vehicles over a period of time. And it can be an average count. This equation relies on traffic volume information and obtaining volume information can be a bit of a challenge for some of you out there and that's recognized. But volume collection is gonna become more important as time goes along. So, so actual or estimated traffic volumes can be compiled and kept by, by state agencies, local agencies, and so on. So the state might be going out there collecting traffic volume data perhaps on some of your system and you might not know it. So, so anyway, so as we crank through this and we go back and look at our two intersections, the vault, this example then shows the two intersections have a, a, 
approximate same number of crashes. So intersection A has 25 crashes, intersection B has 22 crashes. Okay? By factoring in traffic volume or exposure, we're going to determine a crash rate. And the calculation indicates that intersection B may have a more promising roadway to prioritize for safety improvements due to its higher intersection crash rate measured and it's set up for it crashes per million vehicles when they're in the intersection. And that's the way the formula works out. And that's why we got that number one million in there. Even though it has a lower traffic volume. So people might say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The traffic volume is approximately half in intersection B. The crashes are a few less, but when we introduce the analysis of crash rate, it looks like that might be the best place to spend our money. So on the surface, people might say, well, wait a minute, you know, but yet when you calculate crash rate, it's a, it's, it's a higher rate. And it's probably where you need to look seriously about when you make prioritization decisions where you want to put your investment. Does everybody see this? Everybody mm -hmm. understand? Are there any questions? Let's kind of stop right here and ask if there's any questions because this is kind of important when we talk about crash frequency and crash mm -hmm. rate. So this is a great time to unmute your microphones and um, ask any questions. If you guys want to use the chat box, I can read those aloud. So I'm just backing the slide up just a, a bit again, just to look at this simple, the simple calculation. And what makes this go, go around is being able to have a good handle on the traffic volumes that are entering your intersection on a daily basis. I'll ask a question. Hey, Brent, this is Nick Veldhaus. <clears throat> is there some sort of accept, acceptable level of intersection crash rate before you have to fix that intersection or is that lined up somewhere? Oh, that's a, that's a good question, Nick. Um, you know, I think the best way for me to answer that is it's the answer that I always get from a lawyer. It depends. Uh, right. um, I think it kind of comes back to a policy maybe decision. I know if I were running an agency, I would say, you know, when our crash rates get to a certain level, we take a, a, a more of an interest and based upon our budgetary needs. And some people attempt to attempt to come up with a threshold of a, a certain crash rate based upon their budgets and the monies that are available. Some people come back and they try to say, okay, we've got so many intersections in our entire network, you know, and at these intersections, if we have a rate that hits a certain threshold, it goes into a higher prioritization. So there's a number of ways to look at this. And I think that it really depends upon the agency, uh, their managers and directors as to how they want to set up a policy around that. Thank you. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Hey, Brent, can you hear me? Yes. Um, doesn't ITD typically keep statistics of average crash rate for type of intersections or milepost? I seem to remember that when doing a crash analysis. Yeah, they, they do, you know, and you can go in and have those conversations with, if you're dealing with the district or with the district traffic engineer out there and, and they should be able to help you with that. Um, yeah, so then with that data, you can, you could gauge per Nick's question, whether or not you're on average or, or, or higher than average. Thank you. Correct. Yeah, and you can extrapolate. And, and again, it comes back when we talk about the, the uh, concept of the systematic approach, you know, it's, um, we recognize not one size fits all, but if you kind of group common themes or common similarities or elements together, you can kind of start to extrapolate as to where your prioritization needs to go and what, what might need to be important. So again, as I mentioned earlier, we're not building the moon lander. This is, you know, pe some people like to make this in a really super exact science. It's not, I mean, you know, yeah, data, data calculation and so on, it can be exact, but there is a lot of judgment also that goes into putting together a program of intersection safety. Okay, any other thoughts before we jump ahead here? Okay, so, so crash rate. Question. Yes. I wonder, I, I do not remember on the downloaded table, does traffic volumes comes with it or most likely we have to 
find their data ourselves and populate it. Okay, you're talking about the crash data that we, we extrapolated and put into a spreadsheet? Yes. Okay. You calculate yeah, the crash rate, yeah. you need a traffic volume. Yes, you need traffic volume for to calculate a crash rate. And when you look at the, the crash spreadsheet, the one we extrapolated from the crash data that does not come with volume. You have to find that from a different source. Um, and one of the things that LTAC actually has in our, our loan program is uh, traffic counters that can be rented out to local jurisdictions. So um, Rebecca in our office can help if any other jurisdictions are looking um, to use that tool. So as time wears on, traffic volume is going to become more and more important in being able to obtain that data. So, and again, as Ron mentioned, LTAC does have that program. So, so anyway, traffic rate is the way to go because it helps you with your prioritization, but better still, people who maybe don't quite understand your prioritization process, maybe people in the, even the political arena, you can put together a very simple story as to why you're doing what you're doing when it comes to the expenditure of funds and your prioritization. So let's go to another polling question, okay? Let's see, did we do this already? No, we haven't. Okay, let's pull this one up. This one should be easy. Okay, guys, so we've got our next polling question is the termination of crash rate rather than crash frequency better during intersection safety analysis. So it looks like we're almost there. A couple more seconds and I'll close this one up. Brent, we had a comment. Um, the HSM does not lean heavily on crash rates for potential safety improvements, but is geared towards predictive tools. Is that beyond the scope of this discussion? Uh, yeah, the HSM, for those of you who don't know, is the Highway Safety Manual, which is a big, huge, four volume, thick document put out by AASHTO. Uh, yeah, for today's discussion, it's, it's way beyond that. The, high, the theory and the methodology of the Highway Safety Manual takes us more into that proactive field and predictability, and that's way beyond today's scope. So, probably came from FHWA. Uh, Brent, another one. Um, they've looked at the influx of people moving into Idaho and charted the growth. Um, possibility match it in with the crash rate? Yeah, so if I understand the question correctly, you're, you're trying to take, take the um, the growth that is happening and kind of move that forward and kind of predict what your crash rates might be, which is based upon the predictability of crash volumes. And yes, certainly people, and there's methodologies out there that people will um, try to uh, predict the increase in traffic volume over time uh, as growth takes place. And that's very, that's the uh, planners are very interested in knowing what those uh, volume growths might look like as well as traffic engineers to try to stay ahead of the curve uh, number one and number two, it might be you're asking perhaps those that are moving in or developers to help finance some of the improvements based on future traffic volume. And so it's good to have those future volume numbers to help you determine what those improvements might look like. Okay, so there it is. We have the determination. Yes, crash rate is, is uh, more desirable than crash frequency. However, don't throw away crash frequency if you can't get to your volume data. In or, again, in order to do crash rate, you've got to have a good handle on volume data. If you can't have a handle on volume data, crash frequency, which is a number of crashes over a period of time, is still good to have. It's a great, it's a great tool and a great starting point and kind of leads you, starts leading you in the right direction. 
and certainly helps you start selecting good solutions or countermeasures to help improve safety. So good, good thoughts. Okay, so let's go ahead and move forward. I'm gonna go through just another slide or two here, and then we're gonna take a very short break. So when we talk about, when we talk about safety analysis, we, we're talking about now how we can go about rating intersections and come up with some prioritization based upon crash, crash analysis, volume analysis. But we can take the safety analysis discussion just a little bit further. And there's two real big issues that leap out at us from a geometric standpoint. Okay, and the first one that leaps out at us is site distance. Okay, so the geometric of design of intersections can be tr quite tricky and it can create some navigational problems for motorists, but also bicyclists and pedestrians in an urban area. And so we're very interested in, in maintaining great site distance limitations um, and looking at, at what the site distance is doing to us. And indeed, and I don't have it in front of me, but indeed there is some Idaho code on site distance and trying to maintain the site distance. So insufficient site distance can be a contributing factor at intersection traffic crashes. And you might even see that pop up in the crash reporting that we've got an intersection site distance problem. So the driver of vehicle approaching or departing from the stopped position at an intersection should have that unobstructed view of the intersection, including any kind of traffic control devices and sufficient lengths along the intersecting roadway need to be available to permit the driver to anticipate and avoid any kind of potential type of collisions. So some example of obstructions include crops, hedges, trees, park vehicles. I like park vehicles in downtown Boise. I'm a bicyclist. Park vehicles are a big obstruction. Utility poles or buildings. So there's just a whole host of things that can obstruct our site. So in addition, um, to the horizontal vertical alignment, the road approaching the intersection can reduce the site triangle quite drastically. And so the picture you're looking at right now is really kind of a typical site triangle. So it's important to really recognize that motor, approaching motorists on the major road, and that's the road going from left to right across your screen, is needs to be able to see side street vehicles approaching the stop sign. And for the minor road motorists to see approaching major road vehicles before entering the intersection. Poor sight distance can lead to rear end crashes on the approaches and to angle crashes within the intersection as motorists may be unable to see and react to traffic control devices or the approaching vehicles. In the, the intersection sight distance is measured along the major road beginning at a point where it coincides with the location of the minor road vehicle. Okay. The table, and I'm gonna show you a table on the next slide, it provides some recommended values for intersection site distance based on the following assumptions. That there is stop control of the minor road approach that is in place, or stop sign. Okay. That using the driver eye and object heights are associated with passenger cars and not trucks. So we're looking at the passenger vehicle eyesight as our, as our gauge for good sight distance. We consider left turn from the minor road as the worst case scenario. We have to go across the opposing lane of traffic. Okay. Um, and that the major road is undivided two way, two lane roadway with no, with no turn lanes. So you can clearly see, see if we're sitting here, if we get the driver's eye level, use when we're gonna use 15 feet from the edge of the nearest lane through lane that our intersection site distance are measured along these lines. And clearly you can see because we have to go across some lanes of traffic that the one to the left is gonna be a little longer to the right. The question came up yesterday, okay, what, how do I treat vegetation or, or site issues when the obstruction is on private property? And that one can be kind of a, kind of a tricky issue. I think different agencies handle it differently. I'm not a lawyer, but as I understand, there is Idaho code out there that addresses this. Of course, if the, the obstruction, let's say vegetation is within your right of way, uh, from my perspective anyway, nothing is stopping you from going out, cutting it down. Uh, if it's on private property, every agency probably has a policy or how they're gonna handle that differently. I have found over the years, the best policy is to just go talk to the owner with the data that you have. 
we can say, you know, our crash data is telling us we've got a serious situation at this site and we have a, we have a real site problem. Can you help us out? And point out that people may be injured or even killed as a result of this site issue and maybe it could be one of your family members. And so maybe people will be prone to help you that way. Again, if you need to go a step further, then each agency is going to have to kind of figure out and come up with their own philosophy or their own operating procedures as to how they're going to handle that. It might even enter some kind of a legal arena. That's way outside of the scope of our, of our workshop presentation today. So, but anyway, site issues are very, very prevalent and, and uh, can be common. So this table that I'm going to share with you right now is basically one that shows stopping site distance. So stopping site distance provides a sufficient distance for drivers to anticipate and avoid collisions. And this table comes from uh, a design manual. It's uh, one of the AASHTO design manuals. However, in some cases, this may require a major road vehicle to stop or slow to accommodate the maneuver of a minor road vehicle. So to enhance traffic operations, site distances uh, that exceed the recommended stopping site distance is desired. So for instance, if we have a speed of 40 miles an hour, a recommended stopping site distance is 305 feet. But if you're going to design the intersection, your design would probably want to be designed around a site distance of 445 feet. And it just gives that extra added cushion for safety. So as mentioned earlier, if geometric issues are the cause of your intersection safety challenge, and you can figure that out through the data, you may need the help. Maybe if it's real severe, you may even need the help of, a, of an engineer to help do you some redesign to your intersection. So, so you can cure this by simply just chopping down some vegetation, clear on up to the, sometimes the hardcore cure might be, I've got to really look at some um, redesign of the intersection because you may have some vertical or horizontal issues. And, and when we looked at the crash report, by the way, when we looked at it in the crash report, the officer had to report what the vertical and horizontal roadway conditions were like. And as we saw on our examples yesterday, they were reported as being level. So, but if they were not level, you had some sight distance based on roadway geometrics, then you might be faced with a, with a larger project to help fix your crash problem. So we're gonna take a very short break and we're gonna to have to move along, but let's take a little short break, five minutes to go a stretch because we're gonna talk about our next nemesis the skewed intersection, and then we'll we'll leap the train forward from there. So five minutes. See you then. Okay, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and get started. I can see some of you in the picture. Uh, if you can hear me, just raise your hand. Yeah. Okay. All right. So on on your screen, you see a picture of a skewed intersection. And so if we were in a room together, and if I asked the question. Raise your hand if you have any of these in your roadway jurisdictional area. Just about everybody would raise their hand. And remember, when we started our time together, our journey together, we said that you know roadways have evolved over the last hundred years. Went from paths to buggy paths to small roads. The roads got wider, cars got bigger. One thing that hasn't changed over time, in many cases, however, in some cases, is the geometry. You know, when we were on foot. This was an acceptable geometry, but now in the high-speed world of the car today, this is not as acceptable. And so we live with kind of the, some of the crappy geometry. And this is a big concern when it comes to safety of intersections. So in addition to having good sight distance, optimally a good intersection will have legs that come together at 90 degree angles. Uh, intersections that are, that are intersecting angle of 60 degrees or less are considered skewed and they can present some pretty big safety concerns. So is Don there? Don, are you out there? I'm here and ready, Brent. Okay. All right. I didn't, didn't see your picture there. So, okay. So this leads us now to our, our second breakout room, our second breakout session. And so we'd like to get together and ask the question, kind of write down on a piece of paper. Uh, and the question is along the lines of list the problems that are associated with skewed intersections that you see, and maybe just be prepared to list a solution or two to some of those problems. So kind of talk amongst yourselves if you're presented with this and the, the, your task was to improve, we'll find out first of all, tell me what the problems are, 
and maybe even a few just proposed solutions, uh, just, just taking a quick glance at it. Let's list those out and let's have a little report back. So Don, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, I just need to adjust our time a little bit. So breakout rooms are gonna close after five minutes and there's gonna be a countdown uh, timer at 60 seconds. So everybody should be back in the main session now. And if we could have one <coughs> spokesperson from each group and uh, come up with what you guys discussed. Okay, I can hop in first for our group. Um, the problems with that type of intersection is it's a further distance to travel, which leads to more exposure. Um, probably the, that's probably the biggest one. And then number two is, is what we were talking about earlier, which was the sight angle, um, which is, presents all kinds of problems. And the possible solutions that we came up with is a potential reroute, uh, reconstruction, of that intersection, um, you could put in a, a four-way stop with uh, signals, uh, or you could do a roundabout, and that's what we came up with. For our group, we were talking about the maintenance nightmare of those intersections. Everything we work with is square and right angles. So chipping and plowing snow and all that kind of stuff is just miserable, but improving sight distances, move the vegetation back, um, put medians in and just kind of forcing traffic in the direction, the safest direction. I'll follow up. Dr. Go ahead. Okay, I'll follow up on that one. We had something pretty similar. Um, of course, we talked about the site distance being a big problem. And if you can't redesign it, we talked about having a right in, right out, or create a full medium or a curb there. Um, and if that's not applicable, you know, just making sure that there are no trees and shrubs, things like that in the way, and then have signal warnings in advance to let everybody know that there is an intersection coming up, uh, maybe some LED lighting and everything like that. Yeah, this is Dr. Rosa. Um, I'm just gonna go to some of the solutions that we talked about. We talked about roundabout. We're talking about um, making the road not skewed and if not, that's not possible to uh, have auxiliary lane and right turn lane. And um, that was about it. I'll uh, jump in for the uh, independent highway district as part of that group. Um, we talked about some of the issues were site distance, uh, obstructions, um, vertical alignment, maybe uh, contributing to issues at that intersection. Um, speed differentials between the two different roads. Um, some of the solutions we came up with were we talked about minimizing the obstructions uh, would be one way to go. Uh, controlling the speed. Um, again, if that's an issue, you'd want to lower it potentially just at the intersection. Um, do, turning it into 90 degree uh, intersection. Um, if it's a gravel road that comes up to the main road, uh, possibly paving that for several hundred feet coming up into the intersection would help. Um, uh, let's see, putting in a possible roundabout. We talked about that a little bit. And then uh, on the main line, uh, possibly adding some traffic signs before the intersection to let the folks who are driving on that road uh, know that there's an issue at the upcoming intersection and to basically to slow down and just be careful. So that was it, thanks. Great, did we hear from all the groups? Is there anybody missing? Uh, group six, we, um, we talked about many of those same things. Um, and, and as far as proposals, you know, minimum from, uh, you know, some improved signing um, up to a full realignment of the, the intersection. We talked about 
pretty much the same stuff you guys all did. Um, one of, you know, like the picture shown, like having to turn if you're in a big truck, turn to see the traffic come in, you're kind of hanging out in the way. But another one, we had people uh, blowing through intersections because they can't see the crossroad coming up. So I guess if you put lights or uh, the rumble strips, just something to yield signs, stop signs, just try to help people stop and slow down if if everybody's going fast and everything so everybody kind of covered what we talked about too okay brent i'll pass it back over to you all right great well thank you for participation everybody you know it's uh, it's interesting i look at the look at my list and everybody lined up with the list that i had the one one thing that was maybe on my list was that one of the problems might be that older drivers are finding it very difficult to turn their heads, necks, or their upper bodies to, to see uh, what's going on through that speed environment. But I think what's important here, because we're all stuck with these intersections, uh, crummy geometry that is just given to us over time, is that we can come up with some solutions that range from the low cost to the high cost. And ultimately, to fix this type of intersection, uh, it might be that rebuilding the whole intersection would be great. But, you know, that's not always the, can be the case because we only got a certain limited amount of money. So we have a problem there. The data, again, kind of saves the day. We can say what's really happening and what's the most prevalent. And I heard like in the better signage, cutting back page of vegetation, uh, maybe even the rumble strip if you warn people. So these are all really great solutions. And it can demonstrate that you know, even though we're not made out of money, we do recognize there's a safety problem there, and we can certainly, certainly help the cause. So we've talked about during our safety analysis, the as we gather our data, we've talked about how we can kind of analyze it, come up with crash frequency. We've looked at uh, we've got some crummy geometry that we need to address, and to the two big ones is sight distance and skewed angle. So as we kind of conclude our discussion about safety analysis there's one more element that's very important to us. And that's being able to go out and do the field reviews. And so as we looked at our, our sample intersections and we looked at the, um, at the safety analysis and, what, and what's going on, we um, found out that sometimes what we're reading on paper doesn't necessarily match the real world. So it's very, it, it's very um, uh, important to go out and conduct uh, some type of field reviews, even if the even if you're looking at safety from a systems or systematic approach, that spot approach that people have used always in the past, or if you're looking at a comprehensive approach. And there's two basic ways to conduct field reviews. The, the first way is the informal, and maybe you've been involved with this in the past, where everybody in your office just maybe piles into a van, let's just go look at the intersection and let's see for ourselves what's going on. It's very informal, you know, you may or may not write stuff down, you may or may not do a great deal, deal of analysis. The other field review process is to conduct a, a roadway safety audit. And so I want to go into that for just a moment. I'm not going to go real deep into the roadway safety audit process because LTAC offers a full day workshop on how the roadway safety audit process works and how you successfully and correctly conduct a roadway safety audit. But I do just want to briefly touch upon that. Also, when we do the field review, it gives us an opportunity to go out there and look at the compliance, are things working in, in accordance with the manual and uniform traffic control devices when it comes to pavement markage and, and signage. And that, and that kind of helps us in, in two realms. The first is, is you know, do we have all the proper devices in place but number two, if we don't, are we opening ourselves up to any type of legal liability because we have an intersection that is not in conformance with the manual uniform traffic control devices as, been adopt, as has been adopted by the state of Idaho. And indeed, in my other life, my other projects that I do, uh, I do serve as, a, as an expert witness revolving around work zones in the manual uniform traffic control devices. Recently went to trial about the uh, uh, with an agency that was accused of not having good devices. Uh, the good news of the day is the agency won. In, in the end, the jury sided with us. But the fact is, is, is still, there's some liability that goes along that. So if you do a field review, it gives you an opportunity to look at your intersection. So I want to briefly just uh, 
talk just about the roadway safety audit process. It really kind of there's the definition. It is formal. We emphasize that. It's Brent, a, it's a, could you share, yes. share your screen? Uh oh, sorry. Okay. Uh oh. I think I'll get back to that. Okay. Zoom got me. You should have it now. Got it? All right. Okay. So the roadway safety uh, audit process is really that formal safety examination of an existing roadway, and it's done by a, a, just an independent audit team. So you have somebody who is independent in, the, in nature looking at the situation and reporting back to the agency. So you're getting a really kind of an unbiased picture as to what's going on with your, with your intersection or your roadway. So, all right, advance the slide. Okay. So really, really quickly, again, I'm not going to go deep into this because there's a whole another workshop about roadway safety audits that LTAC puts on. If you're interested in this, by all means, contact LTAC, uh, Lori, Layla, and say, can we get a workshop on this? But you typically, typically the way it works is you identify the project or road section of interest, and we've done that. We've gone through the data analysis. We, we were out there, we have actually boiled it down to prioritization. Uh, you're going to select a roadway safety audit team, and the beauty of this process is it brings in people from other other walks of life. So the team will certainly have some uh, engineering aspects, but they also have the Fab Three, which is very important. Is people who operate and maintain the highway maintenance always needs to be part of the team, law enforcement, and EMS because they live and breathe the highway and they know what's going on on a daily basis. So the team comes together, there's a pre-audit meeting where you're gonna review all this information and a lot of the information we've gone through today would be reviewed. You're gonna to go to the field, look at it together. You'll do some kind of analysis and prepare a report for the agency owner. And then you'll present the findings to the owner, but perhaps the director of the agency or the, the board of commissioners. The owner is gonna prepare some kind of a response back saying this looks great, these are the things we wanna do and here's maybe the priority we're gonna do them in. And perhaps you're going to incorporate these findings of, of safety deficiencies into present or future projects. So that's how the roadway safety audit process goes. It's a formalized process and it really helps you get to where you want to go when you're expanding your safety program. Okay, so here's polling question number six that Don's going to bring up to you. And I would be interested to see how many have, been, have participated or have had a roadway safety audit. So the polling question is up. Has your agency conducted or participated in a roadway safety audit? We'll just give this a couple more seconds. It looks like we've got a good response so far. All right, last call. Has your agency conducted or participated in a roadway safety audit? Here's our results, Brent. Okay, very good. Very interesting. Actually, if I were if I were to guess, I would have guessed that maybe the no bar might have been a little bit larger, but 62% no, 38% yes. And, and that's that's encouraging. So again, it is a tool in the toolbox. You don't use the audit process for every little safety issue that comes along, but if you've got some severe problems with, with safety, either on a stretch of roadway or at a particular intersection or two, this audit process will, will help you. And again, LTAC has a separate workshop for that, so if you want uh, more information, you can certainly contact them and they'll be happy to help you set that up. Okay, the, so the final thing I want to touch on on safety analysis, again, is looking at signs and and making sure that our retro reflectivity requirements are up to snuff, uh, that we have good placement of stop and yield signs, and that our sign sizes are, are, are adequate and in good shape, and that we're able to kind of key back to the manual and uniform traffic control devices, and that we're in compliance. Also, it's important to make sure the pavement markings are there and they're fresh and that they have good retro reflectivity. Okay, any thoughts, any, any questions?
So we've gone through problem identification. We've gone through how we can compile our data. We've gone through how we can kind of analyze our data and start to prioritize things as to where we want to go. Let's talk just a little bit about countermeasures, okay? And these are the these are the solutions, these are the fixes that we want to come up with that was going to kind of match back to the story that we told on on what we've discovered in the field and safety. So. Um, to make the most informed decisions regarding countermeasure selection, um, of course, you should begin with, the, as we've done, with the history, a review of the history of the data and observational information. Go through an analysis process. If you have isolated crash locations, the spot approach might be the most appropriate. I certainly encourage people to take a good look at the systems or systematic approach to put in safety improvements at like intersections, okay? Um, so um, the countermeasures presented here and in the following sheets, they represent strategies that have been used by state and local jurisdictions to improve our unsignalized intersection safety along the way. So I'm gonna just flash up to you just a brief, uh, just kind of a brief example. Even if all signs can't be feasibly installed at a given intersection like, like this, enhancement of traffic control devices with installation of part of this signage and pavement marking package can provide some level of improved safety. So here it looks like somebody's really gone to work and, and they, they have had problems with the intersection and they've, they've kind of amped up their, their signage. So some people have gone about the task of building what they would call a countermeasures workbook or a countermeasures element workbook. And if you put together one of these workbooks, I'm going to show you an example. The things that you would want to hit upon are the crash type that you're addressing with this countermeasure or this solution. Where are the best places to use this solution? Why would it work? Let's put that in the workbook. Let's put an estimated cost. Everybody's very interested in money. And I'm gonna talk about, and we'll come back to this. I'm gonna talk about the crash reduction factor. Is there a crash reduction factor associated with this solution? And what I mean by that, if we were to put this solution into play, in place, what type of reduction of the amount of crashes could we expect as a result of that? We'll come back to that thought in, in just a moment. So here's what a typical uh, workbook might look like. And you can see it has the elements that we addressed with the crash type. And in this case, I'm just gonna kind of walk our way through it. So if we were to put together a similar workbook, uh, it would the first thing we would be the crash type addressed, and we're trying to address the right angle crashes that are attributed to drivers unaware of the intersection for failing to stop. And again, as we've looked at the data, the da at this particular intersection or similar intersections, this is what the data is telling us. Okay, we're trying to take the guesswork out of it in case we're challenged. The second thing that we would want to put in our workbook is where to use it. Well, we think this would be a good good. Place to use this would be on minor road approaches, you know, where the conditions allow the stop bar to be seen by the approaching driver, uh, you know, at a significant distance. Locations should be identified by patterns of crashes related to lack of driver recognition at the intersection. So again, failure to yield, some of those elements that we're pulling out of the crash data might help support the installation of this stop bar. Why it works, it does provide a visible stop indicator on minor road approaches to unsignalized intersections, and it kind of helps get the attention of the driver to the presence of the intersection. Time to install these, I think we would all agree that it doesn't take a very long time to install these. The cost is pretty low. Now let's come back to the concept of our crash reduction factor. We think that if we put these stop bars in, in this type of location or similar locations, that we think we can experience a decrease in the number of crashes by about 15 to 19, maybe 20%. Okay, this number, just in a nutshell, has been determined by a lot of studies that have, had, that have been done nationwide, whereby the data was taken before the solution was implemented. The solution, in this case, the stop bar was put in, and then a lot of data was collected afterwards. In numerous similar situations, and numerous, and so then the, the wizards of the universe have come up with a crash reduction factor that we think on average, and again, we're not building the moon lander, so you know, this is, this is kind of a, a, an estimate, but the estimate is kind of based on some science that we could expect a reduction of crashes in the order of maybe 15 to 20%.
So if we were all sitting in the room and I were to ask the question, do you think this is a good return on investment? I think most of you would raise your hand and say, yes, it's a good return on investment. Plus we can tell our customers, our, the traveling public, that we believe we've got something here that is gonna give us a good return on investment. So I'm just gonna go ahead and kind of go down through each one of these elements. I'm gonna move right along kind of quickly. I am, I am mindful of our, our time together. We might go a little bit over, but that's okay. So when we, have the, when we list the crash type addressed, we want to try to match the countermeasure um, to the crash type that you're intended to address. So in this example, you know, it might be that the data shows we have a frequency of right angle crashes due to poor site distance to fix. Let's improve our site triangle. So I think it's, if you're building this workbook, it's always very good to address the crash type and what you're trying to address by the countermeasure you're trying to put in. Where to use it, some countermeasures will have specific types of intersections where their benefit is greater than others. So as an example, the addition of a turn lane is most likely to benefit at an intersection with a high number of turning movement or turning vehicles. So again, if you're collecting volume at an intersection, part of your volume data will tell you how many of these vehicles are going straight, how many are turning. So where to use is important to put in our workbook. Why it works, it can be a brief discussion on the benefit of the countermeasure. To, uh, to determine the appropriateness. Um, it's important to determine the appropriateness and able to address the intersection type crashes. So we try to think about what is the desired outcome of building the improvement and what will be achieved. So as we kind of write a, a sentence or two about why this works in our workbook, we want to try to answer that question. Just think about what the desired outcome is gonna be and what are we trying to achieve. The timeline for implementation, don't get, we're not, we're not building the moon lander. We're not gonna whittle this down to the hour or the half day. Just put down, it's gonna be a short period of time, moderate period of time. Or in the case of our mighty skewed, our mighty skewed intersection, if we're gonna to have to reconstruct this thing, it's gonna take a lot of time. Okay, so estimated cost. It's always nice to plug in an estimated cost. Uh, proceed with just a little bit of caution. Uh, you can just put in, this is gonna be low cost, medium cost, high cost. Uh, be careful if you're grinding numbers because at this stage of your workbook, at this, it's at this stage of putting together costs, you really don't have a real handle on grinding things down to the nearest nickel. You know? So it's best just to stay, this is gonna be low cost, medium cost, high cost. And it can kind of help you with your budgeting. I've only got so many dollars, maybe let's spend our dollars on a lot of low cost because our analysis shows that we've got a need to put in a, low, a lot of low cost improvements scattered throughout our system on a systematic type of an approach. And so crash reduction factor, uh, the crash reduction factor for a given countermeasure is again, an indication of how many crashes your solution or countermeasure is expected to reduce if it's installed. And it's calculated really on research conducted in the pre and post crash frequencies. So again, it just comes back to the data. We took a bunch of data before, put the improvement in, put a bunch of data afterwards. Uh, this has been done on numerous situations, similar situations throughout uh, a region or throughout a section of the country. And this crash reduction factor has been, has been determined as kind of a, an average of what we can expect. So it's important as we look at securing funding, people are gonna start asking, you know, what is the crash reduction factor? If I'm gonna spend money on this, what can I expect? And so it's gonna become even a little bit more important. So it's gonna be important to secure funding and indeed, I'll talk about it towards the end when, we talk, when you're looking at seeking funding from the local highway safety improvement program at LTAC. So crash reduction factors are important if they're available. However, I will tell you that they're not available for all solutions that are out there. Okay, it's still a work in process. I'm gonna leave you with countermeasures. Uh, there's a couple of resources. Um, again, we're not trying to represent an all-inclusive list of countermeasures, and indeed, uh, some people come up with their own unique countermeasures or solutions that they apply at intersections, which work just fine. And then, but there's a lot of kind of off-the-shelf type of countermeasures that are out there as well. So one of the resources is from the National uh, uh, NCHRP Report 500. It's a great little document that gives you lots of great ideas, and there's a few. Um, few resources from the Federal Highway Administration that as you get, get deeper into an intersection safety program, you might wanna look at. They're pretty easy reads and will give you a lot of great ideas, okay? 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, go over, and I'm not going to go through each one of these because we would be here for quite a long time. But I'm going to share with you uh, a little workbook that has been put together. And again, it kind of just points out some of the some of the crash types that is being addressed and, and some of kind of the common things. So you can see here, you know, we want to improve the visibility of intersections by providing enhanced signing and delineation. So the data says that we have some right angle and rear end crashes attributed to drivers' unawareness of the intersection. They're looking for College Road, they're slowing down. Oh my gosh, I can't find College Road. I've slowed way down on this 50 mile an hour highway. Boom, oh, I'm getting rear ended. So you can use this in that type of situation, you know, particularly with the intersections that have rear end or right angle turning tire crashes. Why it works? Well, putting that, putting that additional plate that identifies College Road in large letters identifies to the driver that the College Road is coming up. You're going to slow down to turn, but you're going to do that in a reasonable manner. You're not going to be out of reason. In other words, you're, going to be, you're not going to be out of the expectations of what drivers behind you expect you to do in a turning movement. The time to put it in, not much. The cost is low, but look at the crash reduction factor. As we've put in these additional plates, it's been shown through some science that we could reduce crashes up to 40%. And when we look at higher speed roadways where the, where the injuries are severe or we have fatalities, we are, we are doing away with those injuries and fatalities, which is our primary goal, but we're also doing the, reducing those, those costs as well that are associated with those. So a very, very, Example of a very, very uh, low cost, low time kind of fix will give us a pretty good return on investment. This might be a situation that you look at in a, a, in a corridor of roadway and say, this is a good systems or systematic approach to, to fix this. Okay. So as we scroll down through these, I'm gonna let you, these, these were given to you as a handout. So I'm gonna let you go ahead and go through these on your own again. If I were to go through each one of these individually, Number one, it would take a lot of time, and number two, you would reach through the screen and probably strangle me. So, um, there is one I'm going to bring up towards the end. And again, if you want to stop me and discuss any of these, that's fine. But I wanted to bring one towards the end here that I kind of found interesting, and it's on the horizon. And whether you love it or hate it, I'll let you decide individually or as an agency is our roundabout. When roundabouts first came out for intersections, everybody was jumping on the roundabout wagon. It's like, oh, this is the panacea, one size fits all. This is gonna be the solution. And it's just like anything else new in the maintenance world, engineering world, we've all seen it, that not everything in our toolbox fits the thing at hand, okay? So we have to kind of get away from that thinking. And so when roundabouts first came out, everybody says, this is going to cure everything that ails us. Well, that's not the case. And in fact, roundabouts are tricky. Those of you who've been around these things, they're, they're real estate gobblers. If you do them correctly, they'll gobble up real estate. If you do them incorrectly and try to put them within your existing right away, they don't work as well. And there's, been, there's been a lot of learning curve that has gone through, gone, gone, has been gone through with roundabouts. But let's look at these things. Okay, the crash type we're trying to address are right angle and left angle crashes because of motors unaware of stop or yield signs. Uh, also, to improve traffic flow, uh, roundabouts can be used in a wide variety of urban, both urban and they're now used in rural locations. Okay. They work because they keep traffic flowing. Um, they, uh, a motorist approaching the intersection looks in only one direction instead of both directions. They're high time consumers, as you can imagine, it's major construction. Cost is high, especially if you've got to go acquire additional right of way. It can be very high, especially in an urban area. But look at the crash reduction factor. You know, as the science was put to this, and the type of crashes we're trying to alleviate, uh, it was a 71%. So, you know, anywhere between 50 and 70% reduction. Even though the costs are high, it might be a good return on investment. Again, you just have to use this judgment as you go into that. Okay. So there's kind of a... Uh, just kind of a generic workbook. Uh, there's a section in there on sight distances as well, vertical sight distances. I'm gonna let you go through those on your own. You can read them for yourselves to get further and further into your intersection safety program. But I wanna stop right here. Are there any 
any questions that anybody wants to ask about putting together some kind of maybe simple type of workbook. While we're doing that, I'm going to go back to my presentation screen. Okay. The handout that Brent just referenced um, should have been available to download ahead of time um, through the T2 Center CMS. But I also just dropped it in the chat box and there should be an option there for you guys to download it to the computer on now as well. If you if you want to grab it that way. So again, just like putting together your simple data spreadsheet that you could do on your own and customize to meet your needs, you can certainly start to put together as one of these kind of simple, maybe standard workbooks. And it kind of and it kind of helps maybe demonstrate to people who are running the organization or the or you know local elected officials or whatever. These are some of the things that we think work. And again, key back in on that crash reduction factor. Okay, well, let's go ahead and, and, and start in again. Um, let's see here, I need to, okay. So one of the things that I wanted to kind of touch upon as we kind of wrap up our days together on intersection safety is as we started our conversation, I mentioned to you that Idaho does have a strategic highway safety plan. And it is required. Each state has to put together a highway safety plan uh, to obtain federal highway safety funding. And as part of that planning process, there are there are standalone programs, federal level, um, that address highway safety. So the Highway Safety Improvement Program is that federal program, and money funnels to the state of Idaho as it does to all states if you have a good strategic highway safety plan. And those funds can be used for safety projects that align with the strategic highway safety plan. And indeed, intersections in Idaho, intersection safety does align with the plan. So, so good news for us, we can use this money for intersection safety. Projects do need to be data-driven. You know, that's a requirement that is becoming more and more prevalent. That's why I wanted to spend time together with you to show you how you can obtain data and use it to your advantage. Um, funds could be used maybe for workforce development. I'm just gonna kind of leave that one alone for right now. Um, and then there's a program out there with the Transportation Alternatives Program, that might be an old word, but basically those types of programs funded uh, projects like safe routes to school and so on. Uh, pedestrian and bicycle safety programs in your community. Uh, there might be improvements such as vegetation management that you can take advantage of. And certainly other programs of safety as it pertains to intersections could be the um, integration of behavioral highway safety into your intersection safety program. So one of our, one of our um, methodologies, remember we had systematic, the old tried and true spot location, but the other one was the comprehensive program where we bring like law enforcement to the table to help us improve safety at the intersection. And law enforcement, of course, are very interested in changing driver behavior and there's funding that uh, is available that gets funneled to law enforcement to help them enforce the laws as they pertain to, to intersections. So one of the final things that I wanna to touch upon is project evaluation. And that seems to be the missing link. So as we launch, launch into a good uh, highway safety program or a good highway safety intersection program, it's always good to, to think about evaluating what we're doing. And it serves a couple of purposes. One, it tells us, are, are the improvements we're making good improvements? Are we seeing the needle of safety move? And if so, let's keep doing it. And number two, it may help us justify getting additional funds to keep doing the good things that we're doing and to demonstrate to those who manage us uh, and including even the political arena that we're doing good things. And here's the evaluation and here's the data to prove that the investments we made are actually moving the needle of safety. And so again, we, we, uh, we go about doing this by having a good uh, crash history base, the data. We will select good countermeasures based upon that data. We will continue to collect data. We can certainly do that whether we collect it ourselves through our specialized 
spreadsheet or we let the law enforcement continue to do that with crash reporting, we can construct our simple spreadsheet to help us in that evaluation process. And this just really helps guide us for those good future decisions regarding our countermeasure selection and helps further justify the good things that we're doing. And that we want to keep doing it. Uh, people tend to, tend to look at highway safety on a risk base type of a, of a situation, I guess, for lack of a better term, or, or methodology. I'm just sharing this real brief matrix chart with you just to kind of give you a handle on how risk is sometimes looked at. So on the left-hand side, we'll look at crash or accident frequency category. And on the top, we're going to look at severity, you know, fatal to property damage. So if the crashes that we are encountering, if they are frequent, but the severity is very low property damage, then our prioritize and our prioritizing ranking, and this is a kind of a down and dirty prioritization table, it might be in the middle of our prioritization category. We've got frequent crashes. We want to bring the frequency down, but it's not to the point that we're, we're killing everybody with a single crash. If we go to the other extreme, we may have severity as high as, my goodness, you know, we've got a lot of uh, injury, very severe injury fatalities, and, and the, uh, the, the frequency, I'm sorry, the ac accident frequency category is, uh, is uh, rare. Uh, you know, we may be again in that middle category, but if the accident frequency is frequent, you know, it puts us in a like an F category you're seeing. That's something that we maybe want to give a little bit more thought to, and maybe it comes up in the prioritization a little bit more. Again, this is just a little bit of a, a, a kind of a down and dirty matrix, but I like to use this when I'm talking to people who maybe don't understand prioritization or how we go about trying to prioritize based upon severity and frequency. So just a little bit of a tool in your drawer kind of food for thought it might help you with that conversation. So I'm gonna wrap it up. You know, we're running five minutes over, so I apologize for that. But it's really important in the end to keep it simple. I can't emphasize that enough. There are people who will make this really complex. They'll start talking about predictive modeling and, and do all kinds of engineering stuff. And don't get me wrong, that's important as we develop, you know, theories and methodology and so on. But you can see, as we spent our last couple of days together, how we can also go about getting to the finish line on a very simple basis. So really, very keep it simple. Just identify those issues, gather that data, do some very simple analysis, put in the, the, the countermeasure solution that kind of matches or aligns, or come up with something custom, and then go back and evaluate it. And so you, are, have an opportunity to get funding to do all of this and to keep funding going. So we'll finish on talking just a real, real briefly about the local highway safety improvement program. And so there's a brochure that's out there. I don't have a picture of it except for right here. <laughs> it's out there that LTAC could give to you. And it's a really good one page brochure. And it talks about the process of going to the application process of trying to secure funding to help you with your safety programs and intersection safety falls into that category as well. And so again, as we read this application, it's going to ask you to do some data gathering, do some analysis of that data, okay, to have some mapping to show you, show Beltac where the crashes are occurring. They're very interested in looking at things from a systematic approach. Uh, again, they tend to be low cost solutions, but give pretty much pretty good high return on investment. And also, if I read the brochure correctly, there is an opportunity to use some of this funding to help you pay for a roadway safety audit if you so desire a roadway safety audit. And I want anybody to correct me if I say this incorrectly, but this is a federal program with federal dollars. And so for every dollar that is spent, you will have to contribute 7.3 cents. So it means if you invest 7.3 cents in this program, you'll get a dollar's worth of, of effort or investment returned back to you. I hope I've said that correctly. So you can see that's pretty good. If I were an agency, I would say, wow, I'm interested. But again, 
when you go through this process, you are going to have to be uh, mindful of what is going to be asked of you and certainly data gathering, data analysis and so on. So uh, who should I contact? It's got some contact information uh, that you can contact at LTAC and I would encourage you to have further conversations with LTAC. They can guide and direct you. Okay, so our last polling question and then we have just one more slide and we'll be done. So I'm gonna ask Don to bring up our next polling question. Have you or your agency participated or done any projects through the local highway safety improvement program? And actually, while that poll is going, I can uh, share my screen really quick and I can direct them to the LSIP page. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, let me find the right one. Okay, so we've got the, the LTAC website going over here. So if you're just on their ma main landing page, you can come across this top bar and go to programs. And then down that right hand side, um, there should be one for LSIP, Local Highway Safety Improvement Program. And if you click on that, um, this has a bunch of information about that program and when our deadlines are. We usually put applications out in September and they're due in January. Uh, it's an electronic application. And down towards the bottom, you can see the rankings from past years. And that overview brochure is down here across the bottom. So program overview and there's a hyperlink to a PDF. So you can get to that handout that Brent is perfect as we go as we go through and we think about uh, getting into this program now is the perfect time to really start putting together your thoughts on that highway safety improvement program or that intersection safety improvement program about all the things that i'm going to need to successfully apply for this and, and spend your summer doing that so when you roll into fall you are good to go so don okay so we're going to end this poll and share the results Okay, and so you can see, has your agency participated? 62% no, 38% yes, uh, hopefully, and I'm sure in my answer that those of you that have participated have seen some good results, and we certainly encourage you to really take participation seriously. Again, if I've said it correctly, uh, every 7.3 cents that you spend gets you a dollar back. I hope I've said that correctly. If not, LTAC will correct me. <laughs> so. I think it's, uh, yeah, it's 7.14%. Yeah, so right in there. good program. Okay. okay, so I wanna go ahead and wrap up. I think I have to get back to my screen share here. Um, that said the crash modification factors clearing house is a good reference for, um, for the crash. I think it says modification. Um. Yes, and that's and that I'm glad that point came up. Yes, because as you go in and you get as you, as you ad, uh, develop your safety program and you really are very serious about applying for funds, work very close with LTAC because mm -hmm. they can guide you to these detailed resources like this clearinghouse for crash modification factors. So there's a lot of other resources, and again. I could be here all week talking about some of this stuff and I know everybody would just shoot me. But if you get into it, there you, you're just gonna be taken up further and further down the trail, which is great. Okay. Uh, also, I'd like to mention that when you downloaded the course materials from the uh, course management site for T2, there was also the option to download the um, evaluation form. And if you haven't done that, Don did make it available in the, the group chat. You can download the PDF there. And if you could please fill those out, because we really want to get feedback on the class, especially this is a, a, our virtual attempt. And um, you can fill out the eval form. And you can either, if you, hard, you can mail the hard copy, you can scan it and email it to the uh, Idaho T2 at ltac.org or you can send them directly to me and we'll consolidate that. Um, also Don mentioned that the video, uh, she plans to have that available uh, early next week. So participants may have that as a resource for the future. Don, did you have anything else to add? Okay. No, again, thank, every, thank you everybody for um, yeah. participating today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.